Welcome to Island Baptist Church, today's sermon is over Haggai, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, entitled, Consider Your Ways. We're going to be in the book of Haggai. Haggai, for your information, is not pronounced like that. It's minus an H, actually. Their H was silent, depending on where you find it in the word, and often when it's the beginning of the word. And so, pronounce Haggai without that H, and what does it sound like? Sounds like an Aggie, right? So that's kind of what he is. <laughs> that's a kind of affinity for this man. That's truly the way, uh, you know, a, a lot of the names with, with H's and other things. Hebrew is not, a, not at all like our language. So we're going to be in Haggai. The way to get to Haggai, in case you haven't figured out where it is yet, the table of contents is probably the best way. But an easy way, if you know where Matthew is and you turn left one book, you're in Zechariah, two books. You're in, uh, Zach, well, I'm sorry, you're in, you're in Malachi. Second book is Zechariah. Third book to the left is, is uh, Haggai. So Haggai chapter 1, we're going to be there in just a second, uh, verses 1 through 8. Uh, there was a man who was driving a brand new, his brand new BMW and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of car. And um, he was driving it on a mountain pass road and driving a little too fast, a little too aggressively, wanted to see what the car would do, was excited about it and everything. And and uh, lost control of the car and knew that this was it. It was going over the cliff. And so he bails out of the car. And, of course, the car goes over the cliff and, and uh, is in a ball of flames. And he doesn't get away unscathed. As he hops out, uh, his hand gets caught underneath the car. It severs his hand. And um, so he's standing, albeit not dead, but he's in, he's in bad shape. He's standing on the edge of the cliff looking down at his car. And, and the next car that drives up gets out and runs up. Are you okay? Are you okay? And notices, I mean, he's got a bloody stump. And, uh, but as they get up close, instead of him, I don't know, uh, worried about his hand, he's lamenting about the car. My car, my brand new BMW, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, my goodness. And the guy says, hey, you've got worse things to worry about. I mean, look at your arm. He looks at his arms. Oh, my goodness. My Rolex, he says. My beautiful Rolex. <laughs> and um, that's going to be our sermon today, effectively. <laughs> Misplaced priorities. Uh, stuff that matters as opposed to stuff that doesn't matter near as much. And that is... The point that's going to be made in our actually our prophet today that's going to be speaking to us, and I want to start us out with uh, just some uh, pictures to sort of uh, introduce us to the story of Haggai and the things he was dealing with here. This, of course, is not a Haggai. It's a picture of a church, and I don't know where it is, but um, I find it kind of sad, the building, in fact, because I look at that building and I'm thinking, I, I bet good stuff happened there sometime. Uh, hopefully, biblical preaching, people saved there, lives changed there, people baptized in a place like that, lives rearranged in a place like that, and all to go to that. Uh, it's just sad. It's, um, uh, here's another one. Uh, and of course, it says Christian church on the front of it, but everything else looks like um, God forsaken, doesn't it? Again, sad uh, testimony. Here's the inside of it. I don't know where these churches are from. I know where this one is. This is the inside of a church in Detroit. Uh, what's left of it? Uh, what's wrong with Detroit? You're looking at it. Uh, again, what does the building say? The building doesn't, says a lot about what's happening inside the hearts of the people who at least should have been or could have been going there. Again, uh, what, what happened to this church at some point? You know, beautiful stained glass at least at some point. Uh, gorgeous structure. Uh, people worshiping God in this place, people honoring God, seeking God, being changed by God. I have to believe that. Again, another inside of a Detroit, another Detroit church, just, just in shambles full of dirt and rubble and ceilings falling in and walls and windows cracked and just, uh, and most importantly, no one worshiping there. Um, another church, this is another Detroit church just from the outside. You can't really tell as much, but there's no windows in it. There's roofs caved in. I mean, this is just... Uh, Again, is Detroit the, I'm not after Detroit today, don't get me wrong, just these happen to be the pictures on the internet uh, where I got them. And the reason why I give you these pictures is because of, of, it is a picture of effectively what Haggai is seeing and what God is speaking to through this prophet. Let's take a look. Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. It's a very specific, one of the most specifically dated prophecies in the Bible, Old or New Testament. It gives us very particular dates here, and we are able to verify these the, the same king, you know, is, had a life outside the Bible. I mean, the Bible is a historical book. Every time it touches on history, it's accurate. And, but, but these are also verified by the, by the writings of the, of the Persians and of the, 
of the uh, Greeks that followed and everything. And so this is, we know who this king is. We know exactly what date he was talking about here. It uh, falls on a Jewish calendar here, but it also falls on our calendar as well. So in the second year of Darius, it says, the king on the, day of the, sixth, on the first day of the sixth month, so we're talking about September, if you will, for them the sixth month was hit about right there. The word of the Lord came by prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So he's speaking to the two main leaders and ultimately to the whole, the whole nation of Israel. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, and notice this is what they're saying, the time is not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. It was in shambles. It had been torn down, uh, 586 B.C., uh, Zerubbabel, I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar had conquered this place, had destroyed the temple, had burned it with fire, had unstacked every stone, and they had returned some 20 years prior, 19 years prior to this to rebuild the temple. And he's saying, listen, the key, people continue to say it's not time to rebuild the temple. It's like, okay, it's been uh, 80 years, 90 years. When is the time? Here's the excuse they're giving nonetheless, verse 3. And the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you, yourselves, to dwell in paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Wow. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Take a look at your conditions. See if they don't speak to you. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but not, no one is warm enough. He, he who earns wages earns wages to put them in a purse with holes. God takes full responsibility for their condition. He says, I orchestrated this because you're not getting the point. So I'm kind of, kind of come around another way. Consider your ways, he says. Go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified. And ultimately he's going to go on to say, and be able to bless you. You're holding me back from blessing you. You, you want all these things to happen and you're trying to come at it with your own hands and, and I, I can't open the doors of blessing for you because I'm not priority anymore. I'm not anymore. I haven't been for quite a while, quite a while for the Jewish people. So again, um, and let me just say this before, before you get up and leave, because you think, oh, here we go, holy cow, we came all the way across the United States to come to South Padre Island and thought we'd do a good deed and go to church, and now the preacher's going to preach on giving to the church budget. That's not what we're doing today. This is not about us building this building, even though I will say um, providentially, uh, we recently, as a church, for those of you who are not members, we voted to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on property. And uh, so let me just class this for you for just a second. If you, I started this sermon series more than three years ago. So if you think I'm that good, <laughs> that I planned, knowing the church would be voting two Sundays ago on hundreds of thousands of pro dollars worth of property, and I planned three years ago to orchestrate all my sermons so this would land the two weeks afterward. If you really think that I'm that good, then I need to speak with you after the service because I have some land that I would like to sell you. I don't know if you know this, but there's another island coming up offshore about a mile. And it's going to, in a million, I promise you, in a million days, that's about 3,000 years, by the way, but a million days, there's going to be an island out there and you can get in early on the investment. Just think of, think of Christopher Columbus, all right? Christopher Columbus, if he had known how invaluable the property would have been on South Padre Island, had he invested here, pennies on the dollar, how much he'd be worth. And so, like I said, I'll meet with you as soon as the service is over. If you really think I'm that good, man, I've got all kinds of stuff that I'll sell you for sure. Wow. Talk about take your money. Mm. This isn't about money. It's about a greater need. I believe the condition of properties, budgets, buildings, we're convinced here at Island Baptist, the condition of our properties, budgets, buildings is actually a symptom of something much deeper, either good or bad, whichever the case. Uh, but if you fix the real problem, church properties and budgets fix themselves. They just do. And all the propping up of all those things and the preaching and the hounding and getting people to give and all that kind of stuff it will never do any good if the heart isn't right. See, why, why are these churches in dilapidation? The congregations fell apart. What is a congregation isn't the building. It's the heart of the people. I don't know all the stories behind all these places, but nonetheless, you'd have to assume at least some of that's going on here. Brick and mortar is only a symptom of the heart, and if the heart isn't right, externals dilapidate just like everything else. So what is true for the brick and mortar is true for the soul, and I believe the Spirit of God uses the words of Haggai for us today, calls God's people today, 
to look at a neglected temple, except the temple is not brick and mortar. It's, well, let's be reminded where the temple is today. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, coming to Jesus, right? Coming to him as, living, as a living stone. That's who Jesus is. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, Jesus. You also as living stones. Why are we alive? Because he is. We just celebrated that this past Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection because in part we're celebrating our resurrection. Because when you're tied to Jesus, you're tied to everything that comes from him. Forgiveness and resurrection and life and everything that comes from him. You are being built up as a spiritual house. Hello. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Where is the temple today? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Some pretty serious words here. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. Ooh. One more rep on the push-ups, you know, to make sure you're not taking care of the temple. It says a lot more than that, but that's part of it. I'm serious, it really is. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Keep it that way, effectively, it says. Operate what you are, be who you are, he's saying here. So where is the temple today? Well, that we are the temple. And let me just say this uh, before we get into more of this message. I want to say that we're just, just speaking of Haggai and the prophets and the New Testament writers, which primarily are apostles. Uh, we are, as we've said, said before, we're at tongue-in-cheek, but no less. We're a non-profit organization, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. In other words, we don't have an office of the prophet here. There's not a pastor and the music leader and a prophet here. There's not an offer, a pastor, a music leader, and an apostle here. Let me just say this. Even though I say tongue-in-cheek, we're not prophets, we believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the gifts of prophecy. I believe in the apostles. Some of you may not, and I, you can be wrong all you, all you want to be. <laughs> because here's what I know. The prophets speak every Sunday in this church. The apostles, writers of the New Testament, speak every Every Sunday, we're going to be, we've already heard them. We've already seen a screen up there with, with we're, we just read from a prophet. Hello, tell me the gift of the prophets don't operate in Island Baptist Church. We follow this. They are prophets of God. We don't have an office of prophet in our church per se because we've got so many already. We don't have the office of apostle in our church because we've got so many already. We're not doing what they're telling us already. Why would we have one more prophet tell us something different from God? Does it make sense? We believe in the prophets. We believe in the apostles. And we believe in their gifts. And so we listen to them. And so again, we're non-profit, but nonetheless tongue-in-cheek. We do believe in the prophets. The Spirit of God, I believe, through the prophetic voice of Haggai today, calling us to holiness, to repentance, to repair and restoration the temple of God in our lives, be restored to the worship God intended it to be. That's the message of this prophet. You would do well, and I would do well, to heed what the prophets of God say. Three major points to take in from his prophecies. First of all, stop making excuses for neglect. Stop making excuses for neglect. Here's a well-rehearsed excuse of the people of that day. Verse 2, take a look. We've already read it. They say, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. So when is going to be a good time for them? Seventy years without the temple in exile, God raises a king to the Persian throne by the name of Cyrus, who prophesied, got prophets right, by Isaiah a hundred years before he ever existed, by name that this guy would come to the throne and that he would send Israel back to the land to, guess what, rebuild the temple. That was their whole purpose. Not only does Cyrus send them back and say it's okay to do it, he sends them with government funding, the Persian kingdom. So they don't lack labor, they don't lack opportunity, and they don't lack money. And yet now when we're reading the book of Haggai, they've been almost 20 years without moving a rock or hanging a beam. And they keep saying, it's not yet time. So when is a good time? And let me just say this, just to make sure that you're squirming where you are, because that's my whole goal in being up here. You know that, right? So, so when is a good time to honor God first in your life? We look at these people and say, how can they be that thick? I mean, for crying out loud, God sent them back to this land, and they had all the funding and all the opportunities and all the stuff, and they have 20 whole years to get on a high horse, and they haven't honored God first. And, yet, and we're doing the same thing, pointing our finger at them. How long has it been since God's been first in your life? 
How old are you? Yeah, so it's just, you know, like I said, to make sure you're squirming and that we're not looking down our noses at individuals who are no different than us, no better, no worse. Stop making excuses. The whole, the whole point of them returning was to rebuild the temple. It was the very thing they had not done. They started off, and albeit with good intentions. We all have good intentions, don't we? I don't wake up in the morning, neither do you. I'm assuming, and if you are, I need you to leave right now. Saying, I'm not going to do what God tells me to do. I am absolutely not going to do it. I would say probably if that's you, you're probably not here anyway. Uh, you came to church because really the attitude of the people that are meeting on a Sunday could be other things. It's a pretty nice day. You could be fishing or sitting in the water somewhere. You're coming here because your heart is, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to honor God with my life. Isn't that right? So we're just like them. They, they were not different than us. They, they had good intentions, but here's what happened to them. They, they, they started making excuses. And again, the ultimate excuse we just read here. But here's other excuses I would say that could, we could read in the lines here. I need a place for my family. Is that not true? So they've come back from 70 years in exile, and they come back to a city that's destroyed. Not just the temple, the whole place has been unstacked. And there's no houses, there's no nothing. And do they need a place? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dad with my wife and my kids. Do I not need a place to put them? Of course you do. Do you think God doesn't know that? Of course he does. Do you think he doesn't think that's important? He's going to take care of that? Of course he is. But what I'm saying is, when I neglect the things of God, priority is I don't think he's really taking care of stuff like that. So i got to do it myself. How many of us make so many mistakes with regards to God by, by not having his priority because we think God's not taking care of the stuff that matters to me? The stuff that, how can I do the stuff that matters to God when my stuff is out of order and so we go further and further into this and try to take care of stuff and all the while things become more and more unraveled in our lives as in the case of the people of Haggai. My, my, my family needs a place. I, I need a livelihood. Do you think God didn't know that? Do you think God doesn't know you need a money and a job? I need to grow my business. Do you think he doesn't know that? You think he's, so, but you, your excuse for not putting him first is because these things are first for you? And you're wondering why those things aren't going well? Like I said, Haggai leaves us with no question. I need to grow up my business. I, I, need, I need to repair my house. And God knows all that stuff. It's not that it not, doesn't matter. God says very clear in the scriptures, seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He'll make it work, you see. He'll make it come together. I can't get it to come together. I can't get it to hold up. He, the description, he says, you're, you're earning money and put it into bags that have holes in them. And he, God says, I'm responsible for that. I'm making sure of that. I'm making sure that the blanket you buy is too short to cover with because, because you're not putting me first. You're not. And so the excuses they make at ultimately bottom line is that they're blaming God. I mean, if God wanted us to do this, he would have blessed us more. Have you ever made that excuse? God wanted me to be in church. He'd give me a better job. He'd give me a better this. He'd give me a better that. Really? So it's, now it's God's fault that you're not doing right. Isn't that right? Same thing they're doing. Like I said, we can't find any difference here between us and them. Me and them, you and them. The temple of our lives is in disarray. And let me just say this very carefully. God is not to blame for it. He's not. We blame him, but he's not to blame. Better bottom line is if our life is in disarray, it's because sin is present. And sin is present because we decided to be disobedient. That's all. That's what sin is. I knew it was right, and I didn't do it. I knew it was wrong, and I did it any way. Most sins are conscious sins, especially people, like I said, that are here on a Sunday and not on the beach. You already know. You don't need to know the stories. You know the Bible stories. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. Why don't we do what's right? Because we don't want to. Let's just be real about it. Let's be honest about it. Let's not, the first step to getting over this is to really come out and say what it is. And that's what it is. We've chosen to be disobedient. Disobedience is one of the main characteristics of modern Christianity. You've got so many people in the political world, the only people we can see, and I see other people in other places, who claim to be Christians, and their lives do anything but demonstrate Christianity. Where's the morals? Where's the biblical decisions? Where's the positions that are, yes, contrary to culture, but in agreement with the scriptures, why don't you hold these? All the while claiming to be a Christian. Because that's what's popular to do. That's what gets you votes. 
That's what keeps you up in front of people. We know what the Bible teaches. We just don't do it. That's, Christ, that's the Christian culture today. Tell, tell me if you've never heard this before. God will not use a habitually disobedient Christian no matter how talented they are. God will not use a habitually disobedient church no matter what it's got, no matter what kind of talents and abilities that it has. We, we live in a church age in which, well, opposite of the New Testament church, the New Testament church had no money, they had no influence, and they really had no skills. You got Peter as your main preacher, like I said last Sunday, never opened his mouth except to change feet. And he's your main preacher? Oh boy, how's that going to go? Well, actually really well. Because what they didn't have in any other area, they did have in spades in another area, and that's in obedience. They didn't have anything else going for them, but they could be, they could be obedient. And you know what? They took over the known world 300 years. Our churches today, they're the exact opposite of that. We're affluent, right? We're influential. We have beautiful buildings, and we're in complete, we're in full retreat to the world that's out there that we're supposed to be going out and reaching. What has happened to us? Like I said, what they had in spades, we lack in spades. Obedience. Not that we don't know. We're not illiterate. We're just ignorant with regards to obedience. So let's hear God's word just one more time through this prophet. Look around. Consider your ways. Life and ministry are like a bag you're putting holes in. It's because you're chasing the wrong priorities. Straight up. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be added. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe it? Well, then we need to do it. We need to do it. I know what you're saying. You know, I kind of wish you would get back on the money-giving thing. I think I'd be more comfortable with that. Because <laughs> at least we could put something in the offering plate and get him, get him off of there. We've got three more hours left, so hang on. Here we go. Number one, stop making excuses for neglect. Number two, make God's priorities our priorities. That's the whole message of Haggai. That's his whole message, whole little book, just two chapters. That's all he's trying to get through. God's priorities is that he be worshipped in his temple, and that is what you are. Romans 12, 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It is what you're supposed to be doing. God's got to be priority. He's got to be first. It's not enough to know that he needs to be. It's not enough to be able to tell others that he needs to be. No, it's a matter of actually doing that. When things supersede this, our lives will be, like it, like it says here, like bags with holes in them, empty. Feeling empty? Are you? Sowing more, seem to be harvesting less. Life, living life, but enjoying it less. Having more, but it covers less. I got a word for you. I didn't write it, but it is definitely a prophecy. Heed the prophets of God. Listen to what they say, not because of who they are, but because of, of upon, for whom they speak, God himself. And we let good things, none of these things are bad. Goals, priorities, pursuits, and lives, they're not evil, but they become that when the priority ceases to be God. When something else is first. Oh, I got to do this stuff. And like I said, God knows that you do. I gotta have, God knows that you got to have that stuff. i got to take care. He knows you got to take care of those things. But here's what, what, what you need to hear. The priority is God. He deserves to be it, and you need him to be that. The more, listen, you seek self-satisfaction, the less you're going to have it. That's the story of Haggai. The more you pursue it, the less you're getting it, so stop it. That's what he says. So make God's priorities our priorities, and then finally confess our sin and turn around. And we've already been dealing with that, right? Being honest with it. Call it what it is. It's not, my, it's not God's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. It's not my boss's fault. It is my fault. Why isn't God first in my life? Because I don't have him there. You know, I struggled this week as I was writing this sermon because um, I was thinking about this sermon as I got up early in the morning to read my Bible and had already been 30 minutes on my phone posting stuff on Facebook and doing stuff that were important stuff. It just got, you know, somebody sent me an email, and so I had to answer them, and which led to the, oh, holy cow, look at that, there's another one, and then there's another one. It's like, oh, there's a text, and I did that. And like I said, 30 minutes, and then, I'm, and then I get on the sermon so I can really come down hard on y'all for not being having God first in your life. <laughs> 
So I, I wit, every Sunday when I stand up here and preach, I always want to be better than you in what I'm saying. And I wished I could be. I'm just not. We together have a problem. We do. Or maybe it's just me. But we need to be honest about what it is. The people were spending monies and energies on themselves while neglecting the priority of God, and it worked itself out in a visible structure called the temple, and that's all that it was. The conditions of their heart were directly gauged by the conditions of the temple. So like, like Haggai says four times in this book, consider your ways. We believe in God, right? We mean to spend time with him, don't we? You didn't wake up and say, I'm never going to spend time with God again. No, you came here because you want that. We, we plan to come to church more regularly, don't we? we? We mean to get more involved in ministry, don't we? Again, the bottom line here is it's not what we want to do. It's not, we, don't need, we don't need to be taught to do these things. We're just not doing it. It's just not happening. In fact, we put our work, our family, our fun, and stuff ahead of all these things, and then we come up empty, and we do not know why. Haggai is our prophet today, telling us, hello, I'm going to tell you why right now. This is what's going on. Deal with it. Deal with it. God's coming head on to you because he wants you to take a head on yourself, and he wants you to make a change. Familiar with, familiar with this guy? Kind of scary looking, isn't he? Ludwig von Beethoven, right? He had every picture you see of him has kind of this scowl on his face. Spent the last 20, he was of course this great musician, great composer. Uh, spent the last 25 years of his life deaf. So what a sad, you know, this incredible skill in, in writing music and unable to hear it. And so it's sad and, and you see the frustration on his face there. The frustration is on his face for more than one reason. He was also a man who was in a lot of pain. He dies at 57. And he's ill for the majority of his life. Like I said, 25 years deaf. But he sort of had these cascading events in his life of physical problems and different things. And they're not necessarily related, but it turns out they are. Because what they found out when he passed away, what they did was famous people. They would take a lock of their hair and they would keep it in kind of a little showcase kind of thing. They recently, in the past 20 years or so, tested that lock of hair, strands of it. And possibly just to see, you know, was there a chemical problem? Was there an issue? What was there going on? Guess what they find out? They find out that in the strands of his hair, he has lead levels 100 times the, I can't say the legal dosage, the, 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 above the minimum of, of maximum of what they say you should have. Don't have above this. He's got 100 times above that in his hair strands which demonstrates that that was flowing through his bloodstream. That's the reason why he had all these aches and pains. That's why he had these rants. That's why he's got that scowl on his face. That's why he was deaf for 25 years. And the sad thing was is that he was doing it to himself, and he never knew it. In fact, not only did he not know it, he was doing something that he thought was good for him. And that's how he got lead poisoning. He was a believer in mineral waters. And he was a man of means, and so he had mineral waters piped into his house through, guess what? Lead pipes. And he also drank the same waters, I guess, that he bathed in, which is kind of ugly, but still. He got tremendous lead poisoning, and he had no idea. And so, of course, as he gets sicker, what does he do? He does more. And he can't get it. Why is my life coming apart? And why is it falling apart? And the answer was hard and yet at the same time easy. So in both the physical and spiritual worlds, people often do not know what's hurting them. It, it, God doesn't want his children to be unaware. He's speaking to us today. He's speaking to you today. Will you listen to him? Can't understand why my life is such as the way. Could it be this? Could it be? I want to ask you, please, to bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we consider the prophecies of this man, Haggai. We don't know who, who particular he is, and it's not important. The important thing is that he spoke on behalf of God to the people of Israel, and he speaks on behalf of God to us as we have these living words here in front of us, the Scriptures. Office of the prophet still functioning today, still speaking to us today. And as serious as it was back then for them to heed the words of a, a man sent to them by God, so it is today as this same man stands in front of us through his written words. 
speaking to us today. Will we hear, not hear that man and not hear the, some preacher standing in front of you, but will we hear God in these words? Will you hear him about your priorities, about your needs? Will, will you be serious and consider your ways? Consider the circumstances that you find yourself. There's not always a simple answer to everything, but it, this could be one of them. Will you hear him today? Will you apply this word today? It's not enough to say, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. No, application, turning around, repentance. Stop, stop making excuses for neglect. That's what God's looking for today. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you take the time to mess with us, to speak to us. I thank you for your incredible word that is very ancient and yet very... Uh, modern at the same time. We need to hear you, God, and, and everything that's good in us comes from you. Even the ability to hear comes from you. The ability to heed, God, we're asking you for that. We pray that you forgive, God, our waywardness and our determination to, to just simply not obey you and, and to make excuses, even to blame you for our own disobedience, God. We're sorry for that. We need our hearts to be right, and we need your help, God. We really need you to hold our hand. And we need to humble ourselves and say we've been wrong and we need to be right. And then you need to be first and you need to have priority again or maybe for the very first time. Heavenly Father, we're asking you to open our eyes and our heart for that very thing. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.